Canada has been rooted here for 150 years. Many families are into their fifth generation. For them, France is a dim memory in stories told by grandfathers. But all of this would change by June of 1756. Europe erupts into war. France and Britain will fight for world dominance in the farthest reaches of their empires. Quebec is now a wartime city. Its streets overflow with French soldiers, Acadian refugees and native warriors. The Marquis de Vaudreuil is the first Canadian-born governor of the colony. He believes a Canadian should command the French forces here. War in this country is very different from the wars in Europe. The Canadians and Indians would not march with the same confidence under the order of a commander of the troops from France as they would under the officers of this colony. But France is not listening. Paris sends the Marquis de Montcalm to command in the North American War. He has a good military record, but little money. I believe I must accept an honorable commission, but it would also be a sensitive one, which secures my son's fortune. An important goal for a father. But it was a commission I never asked for, nor desired. The governor and the general quickly come to detest each other. Montcalm loses no time in showing his opinion of most Canadian officers. Longy, excellent. Marin, brave, but stupid. The rest are not worth mentioning. Monsieur de Montcalm is so quick-tempered that he goes to the length of striking the Canadians. How can he restrain his officers when he cannot restrain himself? Vaudreuil and Montcalm will never agree on how to conduct the war. The Canadians fight Indian style, moving in quick, aggressive raids. In one attack, Vaudreuil sends 300 raiders against the community of German flats in the Mohawk Valley. They kill 50 settlers, take 32 scalps and 150 women and children as prisoners. Vaudreuil's war is a war of attrition. It is no longer the time when a few scalps or the burning of a few houses is any advantage or even an object. Petty means, petty ideas, petty counsels about details are now dangerous and waste of material and time. Instead, Montcalm brings European tactics into the wilderness, moving massive siege guns to attack the enemy strongholds head on. In one year, he has two stunning victories. He devastates the British at Fort Oswego. Then he moves south and captures Fort William Henry. In North America, the British are losing forts. But in Europe, the British are losing entire armies. France is winning the war. Powerful minister, William Pitt, advances a new idea. If Britain can't defeat the French in Europe, then beat them in their colonies. A daring two-fold plan is conceived. Invade Canada by land from the American colonies. And by sea, send a massive armada against the fortress of Louisbourg. It will be the greatest naval invasion in North American history.
On the remote Atlantic coast, the fortress of Louisbourg guards the gateway to Canada. To get to Quebec, it must be destroyed. The invasion of Canada begins here at Louisbourg. The British fleet arrives on June 1, 1758, 14,000 men strong. One of them, a 31-year-old brigadier obsessed with glory. Days before the war was declared, he wrote to his mother. All notions of peace are now at an end. We must, however, hope that fortune will favor us, since we do our best to deserve her smiles. Your obedient and affectionate son, James Wolfe. The British fleet begins to bombard the town. Louisbourg's governor is Augustin de Drucourt. He knows the situation is hopeless, but if he can hold out through the summer, it will be too late for the British to move on to Quebec this year. It is a costly strategy. It seems that their intention is not only to seriously breach the walls, but above all to kill the residents and to burn the town. devastation, a heroine emerges to sustain the garrison's morale. Every morning, Marianne de Drucourt, the governor's wife, climbs to the ramparts. This lady has performed such exploits during the siege, as must entitle her to rank among the most illustrious of her sex, for she fired three cannon every day in order to animate the gunners. Marianne de Drucourt even acquires a nom de guerre. She is called La Bombardière. The British will have their own hero. James Wolfe leads a reckless assault to get the first British troops ashore. Wolf establishes a reputation for boldness and daring, but not for mercy. Governor Drucourt asks for help for Louisbourg's wounded. When the French are in a scrape, they are ready to cry out on behalf of the human species. When fortune favors them, none more bloody, more inhuman. Montcalm has changed the very nature of war and has forced us, in some measure, to a deterring and dreadful vengeance. After two months of bombardment, Drucour surrenders. He has delayed the British assault on Quebec for now. James Wolfe will fight no more battles this year. But a thousand miles away, Montcalm's battles are just beginning. Sixteen thousand British troops are moving north on Lake Champlain, heading toward Fort Carillon. Montcalm is outnumbered four to one. I have to deal with a formidable army. Nevertheless, I don't despair. My troops are excellent. From the enemy's movements, I can see that he wavers. If, thanks to his slowness, he gives me time to establish myself, I shall beat them. Montcalm's confidence is well-founded. 
As the British begin their assault, French muskets pin them down under withering fire. David Perry, a 17-year-old militiaman from Massachusetts, sees the invasion of Canada crumble around him. It happened that I got behind a white oak. I lay there some time. A man could not stand erect without being hit, any more than he could stand in a shower without having rain fall upon him. Stunning victory. But Montcalm knows he can't count on the same outcome every time. He needs fresh troops. Montcalm sends an emissary to France to plead for 4,000 soldiers to save Canada. Can we hope for another miracle to save us? I trust in God. Come what may, his will be done. I await the news from France with impatience and dread. The answer won't come until spring when the ice breaks in the river. It will be a winter of worrying and waiting. At Versailles, the affairs of powerful men are swayed by Madame de Pompadour. She is the king's mistress. In a court divided by intrigues and plots, she is an important ally for Montcalm's emissary, Louis-Antoine de Bougainville. Madame de Pompadour showed me the greatest kindness. I often worked with her over the object of my mission. I did not succeed anywhere so well for the common cause as for my personal interest. Bougainville is promoted and awarded the Cross of Saint-Louis. But Versailles is preoccupied with the war in Europe. The Minister of Marine gives Bougainville his answer. This minister loved parables and told me very pertinently that one did not try to save the stables when the house was on fire. I then could obtain for these poor stables only 400 recruits and a few munitions. Bougainville returns to a bleak and hungry Quebec with the bad news from Versailles, and even worse news from Montcalm. One of his daughters has died. Montcalm writes to his wife. I think I would renounce every honor to join you again. But the king must be obeyed. The moment when I see you once more will be the brightest of my life. Adieu, my heart. I believe that I love you more than ever. The time for private thoughts is over. Everyone knows that this year, the British will come to Quebec. From every parish in the colony, Canadians converge to defend the city. Fathers and sons, old men, and boys as young as 12. One hundred and six extra cannon reinforce the walls. To the east of Quebec, where Montcalm believes an enemy landing is most likely, a vast network of trenches and redoubts is dug, stretching for 10 miles. 15,000 men are now encamped and waiting, but no one can conceive the immensity of what is heading toward them. Twenty-two ships of the line, twenty-seven frigates and sloops of war, eighty transports, more than two hundred ships in all, 
one quarter of the British Navy. This fleet stretches 100 miles along the St. Lawrence River. In all, there are 9,000 soldiers, 18,000 sailors, more than the entire population of Quebec. But the commander of this invasion force has more the air of an invalid than a warrior. Chronically seasick, suffering from rheumatism and tuberculosis. James Wolfe, now General James Wolfe, is a dying man. He seeks comfort from a favorite poem, and he marks one passage. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth e'er gave, awaits alike the inevitable hour. The paths of glory lead but to the grave. Aboard HMS Success, Lieutenant John Knox from Sligo, Ireland. He keeps a daily journal of the British invasion of Canada, a country he's seeing for the first time. We have settlements now on each side of us. The land uncommonly high above the level of the river. And we see large signal fires everywhere before us. Country people on the south shore are removing their effects in carts and conducting them under the escort of armed men to a greater distance. As the British fleet approaches Quebec, residents begin fleeing the city. Many head for the general hospital outside the city's walls, where Marie de la Visitation copes as best she can. Since our house was beyond the range of the enemy artillery fire, the unfortunate people of the town did not hesitate to seek refuge here. All the outbuildings were full. The servants' quarters, the, the, the barn, the stable, even the attic was full. The British fleet anchors off the city on June 26th. But Quebec has a surprise in store. The British land on Ile d'Orléans, facing Quebec, and prepare to launch their attack. But it is Quebec that strikes first. Eighty ships and rafts have been chained together and loaded with explosives. Then they are released in the current to float downriver and blow up the anchored British fleet. chain of floating volcanoes bears down on the invaders. It becomes the night John Knox will never forget. Nothing could be more formidable than these infernal engines were on their first appearance. They were certainly the grandest fireworks that could possibly be conceived. Awful. Yet beautiful. Blaze of floating fires, the bursting of the grenades, the crackling of other combustibles, all of which reverberated in the air and the adjacent woods. It afforded a scene, I think, 
infinitely superior to any adequate description. But the ships have exploded too soon. The British fleet is spared. A citizen watches the fireboats burn uselessly. The project was beautiful, but badly executed. The English who at first were dismayed, cried hurrah, and mocked our operations. Across the river at La Vie, the British have entrenched their cannons. The city is waiting. It is the night of Thursday, July 12th. Francois Joseph de Vienne is watching from his warehouse. At precisely nine o'clock in the evening, the enemy sent a rocket from the heights of the Pointe de Livy. from his church, Notre Dame des Victoires. At noon, a bomb fell on the widow Morin's house, set it on fire, and burned it to the ground, as well as the houses of the widow Chenvert, of Monsieur Cardenas, of Monsieur Dessier, of Madame Boisevert. One night, 50 of the finest houses in the lower town were destroyed. During this uh, dreadful conflagration, we could offer nothing but tears and prayers at the foot of the altar during such moments as could be snatched away from tending to the wounded. Gunfire and bombardment terrorized the whole town. The women and children in great numbers near the citadel were continually in tears, wailing and praying. They huddled together and said the rosary. The siege spreads terror and provokes rage. A soldier of the Lassar regiment was killed by a bomb. The English were angry that our men worked on our batteries during the truce. It seems they want to impose their laws on us already. The British are bombarding a nearly deserted city. For the few civilians left, there's a greater danger than cannonballs. Famine threatened to reduce us to the last extremity. Upwards of 600 persons from our house and vicinity, partaking of our small means of subsistence. The enemy, informed of our destitute condition, was satisfied with battering at our walls. Hopeless of trying to vanquish us, except through starvation. The 
British siege of Quebec lasts nine weeks. Every morning, every afternoon, every night, the bombs fall. Almost 20,000 cannonballs have crushed the city. And still Quebec will not surrender. On Ile d'Orléans, the British camp is confused and divided. It is commanded by a very sick man who spends whole days in bed, and even when he's well, he's indecisive. James Wolfe's relationship with his senior officers is poisonous. He ignores their advice, and they dismiss him as a mere career soldier from the middle class. One of his brigadiers is George Townsend, the son of a Viscount. Townsend openly mocks his commander, drawing caricatures which he passes around the camp. To his wife, he writes a bitter letter. I never served so disagreeable campaign as this. Our unequal force has reduced our operations to a scene of skirmishing, cruelty and devastation. General Wolfe's health is but very bad. His generalship, in my poor opinion, is not much better. The summer is half gone, and Wolf can't decide where to attack. His senior officers believe Wolf should outflank Quebec and land upriver. But suddenly, and without consulting his brigadiers, Wolf orders a different invasion, not upriver, but here, at the Beauport shore, where Montcalm's army is securely entrenched. On the morning of Tuesday, July 31st, near the falls at Montmorency, Wolfe launches the invasion of Quebec. 4,000 British troops storm the beaches in front of the Beauport trenches. It's the same gamble Wolfe used at Louisbourg and won. but the French troops and the Canadian militia are ready for them. This time, Wolfe's gamble ends in disaster. The French have crushed the great British invasion. Vaudreuil is jubilant. I have no more anxiety about Quebec. Monsieur Wolfe, I can assure you, will make no progress. His authors say that he will try us again in a few days. That's what we want. He'll find somebody to talk to. is humiliated and desperate. Now he opens the darkest chapter of his campaign, telling his officers, I intend to burn the whole country from Kamaraska to the point of Levy. If he can't capture Canada, he will destroy its harvests, its granaries, its food for the winter. The British range along the St. Lawrence for a hundred miles. They lay waste to deserted villages and farms. The most zealous are men from the American colonies bent on revenge for the burning of their own frontier settlements by the French and the Indians. I've learned that on the south shore, the English as well as burning the parish of Saint-Antoine, have burned Saint-Nicolas and Sainte-Croix. On the Ile d'Orléans, the houses in the parish of Saint-François 
half the homes in St. Fanny, and as well those of Bessin Paul, and that they sent 600 men to the lower south shore to burn the houses and wheat fields. Lieutenant Malcolm Fraser of the 78th Highlanders was marching to St. Anne de Beaupre when his detachment was fired on by 200 Canadians and Indians. But he was more disturbed by what his own side did. There were several of the enemy killed or wounded, and a few prisoners taken, all of whom the barbarous Captain Montgomery, who commanded us, ordered to be butchered in a most inhuman and cruel manner. Wolf is despondent. He knows that failure here means public disgrace in England. He writes a letter to his widowed mother, ending with a startling announcement. I approve entirely of my father's disposition of his affairs, though perhaps it may interfere a little matter with my plan of quitting the service, which I am determined to do the first opportunity. I mean, so as not to be absolutely distressed in circumstances, nor burdensome to you, or to anybody else. Time has run out. With summer at an end, the Royal Navy must pull out all its ships in two weeks. Wolfe writes to the British cabinet. I found myself so ill, and am still so weak that I begged the general officers to consult together for the public utility. They are all of opinion to draw the enemy from their present situation and bring them to an action. I have acquiesced in their proposal and we are preparing to put it into execution. The generals decide that 5,000 men will invade 30 miles upriver, but at the last moment, rain delays the attack. While the invaders wait in their ships, Wolf wanders off by himself, back toward Quebec, always examining the North Shore. No one can quite believe what he comes up with. Wolf will gamble one more time. <laughs> <laughs>